Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Fred. Um, it, is, it is very nice to see everyone here. And, and the very first proof that the Europe crisis is worsening is the size of this audience. Because <laughs> I, I think in July, it was you know, certainly there weren't people at the back wall. Um, and I know the lunches are great, but that's not the reason either. So that, that's the title of our presentation. And let me start by uh, doing what I, I think is really important in all these crises. Because crises, we've all lived through lots of them. I've, I've lived in countries where they've occurred. And Simon and I have gone, gone to many over time, just out of fascination of the economics. But they always have a certain dynamic to them. They sort of lurch forward and then pull back, and lurch forward and then pull back. And people create a storyline around the crisis. And you've always got this moment and this hope at every, every step. And then eventually, when they fail, they just fail in one big collapse, which is quite ugly. Uh, or you make it through, right? And you, you do often make it through. Brazil, for example, not so long ago looked like it was in trouble, and now it's a, a star. Uh, but this, this chart here, I, I think we should all just be agnostic and look at it. This is a chart showing the CDS spreads of countries in Europe. And it's a logarithmic scale. So as you know, these things would rocket, rocket up if we had a linear scale. And you can see the black line there is an average. Uh, it's called the Sovex index across uh, European countries. And you can see the CDS spreads are just trending up. And that, that's not good, right? I mean, they've, they've gone up a lot since uh, July when we were here last. Uh, and they continue to trend up. Now, there is a storyline around all these peaks and bumps and troughs and all the rest. We all know when Greece was bailed out, aha, they've finally done it, right? They've come in with a big amount for Greece. Sarkozy had to push uh, Merkel into that package, and they did it, right? And then it was supposed to be OK, and the spreads went back down. But then it got worse again. And then there was another package for Greece. And then there was a package for Ireland, and then a package for Portugal. And now we're worried about Italy and France, even, and Spain. Um, so it just keeps going up and up and up. And you can fit a lot of stories in your mind around these whole charts. And you can say, this is why it's going to turn down now, or this is why it's going to turn down later. Uh, but so far, we've had those stories. And each time, those stories haven't worked. Now, the next chart is a chart showing the CDS spreads on a linear scale. And I've taken out the basket cases, like Greece, which clearly now is going to default. Portugal, which is certainly heading that way. And this just shows you what's happened very recently in the much more solid countries. And so when we were here on July 21st, France was half its current level. Italy was half its current level. Uh, Italy now has 500 basis points CDS spread, which implies roughly a 35% chance of default priced into the market uh, over the next five years. And France is about half of that. So it's spreading into the core nations. And we could all talk about why we think this is happening and everything else. But I think it's very important just to sit back and look at the chart and realize it is spreading. It is getting worse. Despite all these measures that keep being taken, it is not, not slowing down. Now, there's something more worrisome I want to mention. And to me, actually, this is what got me very nervous in November. Um, this is a chart showing euro-denominated interest rate swaps. Now, these are the nuts and bolts of the financial market, of fixed income markets. Swaps allow you to convert fixed rates to floating rates, which is very important if you raise money in, in a fixed rate market like a corporate, but you, you uh, want to pay floating rates, or vice versa if you raise floating rates, but you want to lock in your mortgage into a fixed rate. Uh, you can do all that in the swaps market. This is how banks, pension funds, everybody hedges their interest rate risk or adjusts it. The reason we can have annuities with fairly safe payouts is that we can have the annuity provider go into a market and use a swap in order to hedge out the risk they have when they take out on that long-term liability to pay your pension. So this is the size of the euro-denominated swaps market. And it's very interesting. It was zero in 1998 because there was no euro, of course. Uh, and then it grew. And it grew and it grew and it grew. And now it's up at uh, 2 times 10 to the 14th. Now, I didn't put the zeros on because there's so many zeros. But that's $211 trillion of swap markets outstanding. 
Now, that swap market, as I said, is, is integral to all banking and all finance. And were it to fall apart, we would be in deep trouble. Now, I told you it's euro-denominated, euro-denominated swaps. What happens if the euro breaks apart? That whole market is very questionable. What does it mean to have a 10-year euro-denominated swap? It's like a 10-year bond in euros. If you're uncertain, the euro will exist. Well, it no longer works as an annuity hedge. It no longer works as a pension fund hedge. It no longer works as a hedge for banking because there's going to be a big risk premium on the euro priced into the swap market. And that is a very leveraged financial system when there's $211 trillion of those outstanding. Now, we can all be very happy because, as Simon has pointed out before, European banks are regulated extremely well. Right? So this, this particular market is not dangerous because it's extremely well regulated. Don't worry that it's 15 times Eurozone GDP. No problem. They've got it all down really well. Um, but that, that is the concern that we all have. Now, I raise this issue because what happened in November and what got me worried is shown on this chart. This is the Euro 10-year swap rate. And as this crisis has lurched forward and backward and forward and backward, this, the, the general pattern has been when you're running for safety within Europe, you run to German bonds. To some extent, until recently, you ran to French bonds. And you could run to the swap market. The swap market is interbank lending, right? So it's swap rates are set by banks, by 44 banks within Europe, the short sw swap rate. And it just measures the rate they lend to each other at. So, you could run to all those things because they were considered safe, right? First it was Greece wasn't safe, then it was Ireland, then Portugal, then Italy and Spain. Um, but what happened in November, and very worrisome, is this 10-year swap rate rose from 2.4 to 2.8%. And this was at a time when people were f in fear and they were running to US Treasuries. US Treasury rates were going down. The banks in Europe saw their spreads going up so there was definitely credit risk getting priced into the swap market. And then, at the end of November, Germany ran an auction and they had a lot of trouble. For one of the, you know, very rarely does Germany not have a successful auction. They didn't get enough bids to meet their maximum quota of bonds that they were gonna sell, if you remember. And that was when people got very scared. And what was happening here was it was the first time, at least in my mind, that I'd seen it. People were clearly fearing that the euro itself would break down. Germany issues bonds in euros. If Germany has trouble raising finance in euros, that's when the eurozone will break down. But something else will happen. If the swap market breaks down, the eurozone will break down because there's just too much money in those swaps. There'll be too big chaos if the swap market breaks down. And these are the things that are underlying the eurozone today that are very dangerous. Small changes in tail risks, small things that drive up risk premia, can topple these markets. And that's, that's the essence of why we think it's dangerous still in the Eurozone. Now I want to go through and talk about are, are things getting resolved? And I'll start with a bit of history in the way we look at it. Uh, when the Euro area began, it was obviously a, it's a wonderful thing, right? It's a wonderful thing to have uh, the European Union, to have the countries united. It certainly is nice to have a single currency doesn't have to be a single currency zone to have the wonders of the European Union, but it improves it. Uh, but it began with a false incentive structure in the sense that in the Eurozone, when they create money, uh, they do it by lending to you against securities, against collateral. And so when Greece joined the Eurozone, all of a sudden it could issue all the bonds it wanted into a very liquid market because ECB would use those as collateral and you could borrow against your Greek bonds at the ECB discount rate. And you could leverage that uh, at the very short end 200 times. So the creation of the European Monetary Union, or the ECB, created the ability to leverage all sorts of bonds that previously were illiquid or were much harder to issue. And that was true for banks too. Their balance sheets became highly liquid. So a small bank in a small country loves joining the Eurozone because your balance sheet becomes much more liquid. And so this was an attraction to bring in lots of countries. Everybody's knocking at the door wanting to join the Eurozone. And that's terrific, but you've got to regulate it because everybody will try to issue credit. And some people we know are great about credit and very careful, and some people are not. 
And that was the problem in the Eurozone. It allocated credit to bad credits because there was an incentive to issue it and it just, the regulation just didn't work well. So Greek sovereign debt over 10 years rose by 158%, Portuguese sovereign debt by 152, Irish bank loans rose by 257%, and loan deposit ratios, a sign of how leveraged banks were, uh, went up uh, by double in Greece, Ireland, Portugal, and Spain, while they rose by 50% in Italy. That's just a flawed structure, uh, and it was a mistake. And unfortunately now, we're unwinding it. So when you create these incentive structures, if you allow people to borrow and borrow and borrow, and you don't regulate it well enough, then they borrow too much, and then it collapses, right? And that's, that's the way markets work, and we all know about that sort of cycle. And that's the cycle we're in. People borrowed and borrowed and borrowed. Now it's quite clear that actually there's no bailouts in the euro area after all. People thought there were investors and politicians both until recently. And they've said, okay, we're starting with Greece, we're gonna have the first default, and there'll probably be more to come. Well, when we met in July, they hadn't yet declared it would be a default, but the summit was going on at that time. Now it's called a voluntary you know, restructuring, but of course it's a default. And from the point of view of an owner of a European bond, and these are all under domestic law generally, you've had a clause introduced into your bond, and that's the clause I've written here. In the event that the issuing sovereign cannot, ad cannot adequately finance itself in markets at reasonable interest rates, and if a sufficient plurality of the EU, the Council of Ministers, Eurogroup, ECB, IMF determine it is economically or politically expedient, then this bond will be restructured, okay? One of the editors of our note asked us, could you please reference the document that came from in the bonds? Um, and of course that was made up by us. There's no document, but that is the feeling, right? If you're an Italian, if you're an Italian, uh, if you're holding an Italian bond, that's, that clause is in your bond, right? Every time Monty goes and meets with Merkel and Sarkozy, you should uh, start getting a little bit nervous, right? Because they could come out of that meeting and say, well, we need to restructure. You know, we made a mistake. And so every bond in Europe has this risk, uh, and you've got to be careful about it. Now, there's a second thing we learned subsequent to July. Greece got in worse condition after July, right? We all learned the budget was worse, the growth was worse, everything was worse than previously, and they had less money than they thought in their revenues, and somebody had to make up for that. So who gets to make up for it? Well, as bondholders, now you may not be able to read that, I've added a PS to this clause. If the above clause is triggered, then one, the bondholder is junior to all official creditors if the official creditors so decide, and two, two, the issuer reserves the right to change law as needed to negate any rights of the bondholder, right? That's all true, right? That's exactly what happened. Very little money, if any, was added into the Greek bailout packages so far, but the haircuts were dramatically increased for the private sector. So if you're a bondholder, you realize, I've got this Italian bond, they've just done this to Greece, I know my residual rights are minimal if things go wrong, I've gotta have a big risk premium on my bonds. And that's true for every country that's in trouble. Now, for Italy, this is very dangerous. Let's just throw some numbers in the air. Let's suppose you think there's a 10% risk of a funding crisis over a year in Italy that would trigger that clause. And then, for sure, I promise you, Italian bonds will fall at least 50% if that clause is triggered. Then you need to have a 500 basis point additional spread on your Italian bond. And that happens to be roughly where the CDS spreads are today, uh, 500, 500 basis points. This is the type of spread that's been injected into every bond in a troubled nation in Europe, and it's gonna stay there, right? The stock of debt in Italy is 120% of GDP, and so, Ceteris paribus, you've now got to have a 6% higher primary surplus, that's 5% times the 120, in Italy to stabilize the debt levels, given this new risk premium. And that's the problem, okay? All these countries now have these higher risk premiums. They're structural, they're here to stay. You know you've got default risk. It's gonna be very hard to get rid of that. And that's, that's uh, leading to a lot of troubles. So, Naturally, once you say, I don't want to hold Italian bonds, you sell them off, the risk premium goes up, the banks who hold the bonds also look in trouble, you know the economy's in trouble, you get capital flight out of your country. 
So when we were here in June, there was zero capital flight, uh, or July, it was just starting. Uh, we were saying that it looked dangerous for Italy, and you can see subsequent to that up till end November, the Banca d'Italia statistics show 150 billion euros has left uh, Italy through the payment system. This is people taking money out of Italy or foreigners uh, withdrawing their deposits at Italian banks. Now, across the Eurozone, this is happening, of course, and we've mentioned this before, but I'll just show you the latest Target 2 data, which show the payments, cumulative balances across countries of where money's flowing from and to within the payment system. Out of uh, Greece, Ireland, Italy, Portugal, and Spain is roughly half a trillion euros, and most of that has gone into the Bundesbank uh, as credits in Germany. And of course, these are credits of the Euro system from Germany's point of view, uh, but Germany is, is responsible for roughly 40% of those if the GIPS countries actually did default. Now, when you have capital flight and, and these other problems, of course, you start going into recessions, and that's where uh, the PMI manufacturing, which is a leading indicator of, of economic output, suggests Europe is heading. And there's a general consensus that, in particular, Italy and Spain are going to be having recessions this year in 2012. When that level is below 50, it, it says purchasing managers are telling the surveyors that things are, are declining. Uh, below 50 is declining. So for the last couple of months, it's been in declining territory for, for all those economies. And unemployment rates have shot up. And so those countries who benefited from the Eurozone through these credit expansion, et cetera, uh, at the start are now feeling very large pain as the capital flows out of their countries. They've gone from integrating to disintegrating. And you can see uh, they're losing jobs and their economies are moving into recession. So uh, Greece, Spain have very high unemployment rates. Italy actually is doing quite well, but something to watch because obviously there's a, a risk for quite a big negative shock in Italy in terms of the recession, the budget outcomes, and unemployment going forward given all the problems. So what, what should be done or how would you think about solving this? And now I want to move on to a storyline about about what next, right? And I, again, I'd say it's a storyline because that underlying data is telling us things are getting worse. But Simon and I generally you know, feel as follows. If you were not in a currency zone, uh, a monetary union, what would you have done? Well, you would have just seen your currency collapse. You would have had a big devaluation. That would have helped you a lot. And maybe you would have defaulted on your debt. Right? And for countries who don't issue their own debt, Reinhardt and Rogoff tell us that maybe you can have 60% of GDP as a total debt stock before you run into problems. So Italy probably would default once you realize there's no bailouts. Um, so would Portugal, so would Ireland, so would uh, Greece. And so you'd have a big devaluation, you would have uh, 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 debt restructuring that would deal with your debt overhang. And with devaluation, you would have your wages fall and you would become much more competitive. And we see in Russia, Argentina, uh, all the Asian countries after the Asia crisis, you get back to quite rapid growth a year or two after the crisis, very rapid growth. So if you're in a monetary union, you've got to agree to adjust, but you can't adjust that way, right? So how do you adjust? Well, first of all, we're arguing these are real debt overhangs. They won't just disappear now. There's default risk in debt. You've got to deal with it. So you've got to reprofile it and maybe restructure and write it down. Uh, and that's true for, for all the GIPs, really. For, and Spain is, is questionable within that, but certainly the other ones. Cut fiscal spending very sharply. If you want to bring down risk premium, you have to make people feel your debt is going to fall. So you have to move to a surplus, right? You can't just be running ongoing deficits. And you have to have wage packs that change competitiveness. And then longer term, you have to change incentive structures within the Eurozone. And long-term fiscal compact matters, but that relies on regulation. And so people aren't going to trust that because it's been so badly regulated on the fiscal and banking side in the past. And long-term plans for better capitalized banks. And I'm not going to go into that, but that requires a lot of restructuring of the banking system. So let's start with reprofiling of debt. As I said, I don't think you get away with the get rid of the risk premiums in Italy unless you reprofile the debt. What you can see here is that the Italian debt to GDP ratio shot up between 1980 and 2000 
from 60 to 120. This was a time when the, Italian, the Banca d'Italia was effectively playing chicken with uh, the Treasury. The Banca d'Italia was uh, no longer uh, refinancing the Treasury like they did in the 70s. They got legal independence, but there was a fight going on. The Banca d'Italia never made them go to fault, but they were tough in providing the financing. So Italy had very high real interest rates. Savers in Italian bonds did well, but the debt stock shot up. You can't have this game of chicken again, and that's what we've got with the ECB today. Italy is sort of playing chicken. You know, they're supposed to reform, reform, and the ECB buys a little bit of their bonds. They have to bring the risk premium down a lot, otherwise you're definitely gonna have to restructure that debt. But you can't have high real interest rates with the current stock of debt, it's already too high. This chart is just commenting on spending plans, and I'm, I'm just for the sake of time, only gonna say something briefly. Latvia, as Anders Osland, who's here at the Institute, has made very clear, has had a very big adjustment. They've had an adjustment of the style you saw in the 1920s under the gold standard. A big cut in spending, they brought their budget deficit down, and now they're starting to grow again quite quickly. But look at Ireland up top. The blue line is the general government spending from before the crisis, one year before to 2014, and you can see spending rose a lot the year of their crisis, and it's only gradually declining. They're still running a 10.5% GMP budget deficit in 2012. Their debt is building up. They've got 140 odd percent of GNP in debt, and it's growing, okay? This is not gonna bring risk premiums down in Ireland. So you can be sure we're gonna have a difficulty with Ireland refinancing itself, and they're expected to go back to the markets in 2013 to refinance themselves. Competitiveness, this is unit labor costs from the OECD. The black line is Germany. The other lines are uh, Greece, Ireland, Italy, Spain. Those are the ones that were available. What you can see from that is there hasn't been much change over the last couple of years, despite the current programs. So again, it's not like a big devaluation. We still need more change in order to, to make these economies competitive. What's going on in the macro programs is they provide big bailouts, but countries are reticent to do the wage adjustments and the other spending adjustments that they need to do and they survive with the bailouts, and it just won't, won't work. And so lastly, people talk about now is the time for a big bazooka, and the Germans are reticent to do this, and I would be very reticent too. The whole idea behind a bazooka is that you don't need it, right? The Paulson comment was, I've got it in my pocket, don't worry, I won't take it out, but then he took it out, right? Uh, but in this case, if you go in and you announce, we will bring down the Italian risk premium to 2%, two so Italy can afford its debt again, what's gonna happen? Everybody will sell their debt, right? Because they've got way too much debt given default risk. Plus, you know that as the ECB buys more and more of the debt, you are the residual bondholder, and you know that if they default, you're gonna get hit even more because they own more and more of the debt and they don't take a haircut. So. What's happened in this market is that it's unstable. And effectively, if they come in and start saying, we'll drive down the risk premium, they will buy a lot of bonds. And unfortunately, they'll buy so many that probably the Germans and others will start to feel this is not working. And they could introduce currency risk where people say, actually, I don't even trust the euro. And that goes back to the swaps market. You'd start to say, my God, if there's high inflation or the euro breaks up, what do all these contracts mean? And you could easily see this thing get into deep trouble because the size of all these markets are so large, you couldn't bail out the swaps market at $211 trillion. So what we've done here is just show what would someone in, in markets think might be the amount needed by the ECB if they start this big bazooka program. You know, base case to 2016 is, is somewhere around two and a half trillion to buy up bonds and finance deficits. But then the IMF said, well actually Greece alone may need total aid of 550 billion euros, over half a trillion, under their bad case scenario. And so we put here a bad case, and it, it, you get up to four trillion, four and a half trillion very quickly in bad cases. That's a huge increase in the ECB balance sheet. It's a huge credit risk for the whole euro area, so it's very unlikely to happen. But even if it were to happen, I think it would scare people along the way, and it would be dangerous. You might cause people to decide, I won't even buy German bonds because I'm worried about the euro as a whole. So I don't think even the bazooka is gonna end up being a, a, a solution here. So 
what would we say then about these various steps for a comprehensive reform? We'd say, so far, we're not seeing the debt overhangs removed outside of Greece. So far, fiscal spending cuts are not enough to bring budgets back to balance. Debt's still building up in the periphery. So far, wage packs haven't brought competitiveness back. Uh, Long-term fiscal compact, they're there. There's going to be big austerity coming, maybe, in the, the more core countries. Uh, but you must question whether that's going to be enforced. And then long-term plans for better capitalized banks, I won't go into that, but there's, a, there's, there's just not a lot going on yet. So let me end with that, and I'll pass it on to Simon. So I, I think uh, Peter summarized all the main points, and, and we uh, had the word from the chair that I need to be very brief. I, I think the, we're often asked, when will this happen? How, when exactly does it unravel? And, and, and I uh, always quote uh, Ru Rudy Dornbusch, who famously uh, remarked that uh, it always takes longer than you think. And when it happens, it always happens with a speed faster than you could have imagined. And we don't know exactly when it's going to go wrong. We don't know exactly which path it's going to take. We think it's about the collapse of a highly leveraged system, a system of, of unregulated financial transactions, particularly in the form of derivatives. And all of my interactions, our interactions in Washington and in Europe indicate there is nothing any official wishes to do about this in a preemptive manner. One trigger is obviously that you have social unrest. I understand that people are still voting for the programs. That is what you expect at this stage. Uh, that the, the Argentine currency peg, the repeated IMF bailouts were popular for a surprisingly long time until it collapsed. Italy, Portugal, Greece, take your pick. The, the richer countries can also give up. Um, that, that this, of course, is, is Madame Le Pen uh, in, in France who's putting pressure on, on this issue. And, and if you don't recognize the banknote at the bottom, it's a Deutschmark, and you may see them again soon. <laughs> I know some of you won't like to hear this, but Paul Krugman could be right. <laughs> it has happened before. It is entirely possible that the dynamics of austerity will just prove not to be sustainable because the economies contract so much that the debt burden becomes unfinanceable and official credit is back away. And, and of course, the amount of money, base money, that is proposed to be created, implied in, in the scenarios that Peter laid out, but we're taking that logic from official statements, including the IMF. This is something in the order of a four trillion euro creation in, in the pipeline on, on a monetary base of about 2.5 trillion. I, I spoke in, in, in Zurich on Tuesday to a group of German institutional investors who were actually, I would say, rather pro-euro at this point, but completely convinced that this leads to inflation. And, and so I, I don't understand how inflation expectations remain stable in this situation. Well, perhaps it's all of the above. It's some combination that we cannot foresee, but th the underlying characteristics of the situation point towards a breakup. Unless there is preemptive, decisive action on the part of Europe and Europe alone. This is no time for a bailout. There won't be a bailout from outside, from the United States, from, from the IMF. This is for the Europeans to do. We said it in July. We said it before. We've been saying it consistently since the fall of 2008. They haven't done it to date. And if they don't get ahead of this right now, we are headed for serious trouble. Thank you.